Okay, am I live and talking? You're good to go. All right. Well, this is a this is a very exciting presentation for Steve and I. Uh, we've uh, we've spoken to HGS before, and uh, I'm going to try to get the pictures out of here. I have to, and uh, it's a great organization. I'm glad that uh, we have attendees watching this. Now, I'm starting out here with my big picture. You know, we've got the Earth. Uh, we've got, uh, let me see, I'll try to get the, 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 the pointer back. Okay. You know, this is a huge thermodynamic system, as we all know. And we get up to the uh, crust, which is the continental plates and such. And that's where the action is, as far as we humans can tell. Then you come over to the atmosphere and we really have our atmosphere is the, is the portion of the atmosphere that makes weather. So we've got about 12 kilometers of atmosphere. The rest of it, we're never, we're never going to live in that. And so it gives perspective to the whole physical environment we live in. And I just like this uh, uh, moonscape, I mean, uh, Earth, Earthscape from the Apollo 8, just to throw it in there. And I hope you're familiar with the Carl Sagan uh, commentary on the pale blue dot, that little dot to the left of my laser pointer, that's Earth, you know, 3.7 3 billion miles away, taken from the Voyager satellite. Um, now, my, my experience with geothermal, maybe it's like a lot of you geologists, uh, we went, to, I'm from Rhode Island, the family made the trip around the country, went to Yellowstone National Park, saw all the geysers. And then years later in school, I realized I was taught that uh, there's plumes, and this is a mantle plume that comes up and creates the whole Yellowstone complex. And then, uh, oh, sometime after that, our family moved to Turkey for a while, and I had the opportunity to go to the Travertine Baths at Pamukkale. And it was in the winter, so it was quite, quite an adventure for a young person. And now that, uh, and, and there's actually a term for that, it's called uh, balanology, that's when you go to hot springs. It's a, it's thermal energy. And as you can see, that's in this portion of Turkey, uh, east of Izmir. And Turkey now is a major producer of geothermal energy, something over 1,500 megawatts. Uh, for modern geothermal, it all started in uh, Lagilro, Tuscany, Italy. And uh, this gentleman, uh, Count uh, Prince Conti, their family had a, um, a boric acid uh, company, the, the lakes in the area of acidic from uh, volcanic activity. And he created this first 10 kilowatt power plant. Uh, 10 years later, they got up to a 250 kilowatt power plant. And uh, uh, now today, it's a, it's, it's a major center. It was bombed out in World War II, of course. And, uh, but other countries have come to this area and uh, looked at it to learn geothermal energy. This is a, this is a science, an extension of geology, and a, uh, uh, a business area that's really not that old. It's now, I guess you call it 100, 120 years old. So there's a lot to learn, and, and a lot of, uh, of, of original players are still around. So. As you might surmise, as geologists, uh, where the thermal areas are active, is the Hawaiian Islands, um, Iceland is both a plume and a plate margin, and uh, in the tectonically active areas of the, uh, the mountainous regions of Europe, uh, through uh, the subcontinent, uh, the uh, uh, active continental plate margins of Southeast Asia, and Let's not forget New Zealand, uh, but just don't go to volcanoes. Don't get off the boat to go to see a volcano. Uh, I put this map in. It's a complicated map, and I'm not going to dwell on it, but it goes to show in, back in 2004, the AAPG was getting serious about geothermal energy and uh, working with the SMU Geothermal Lab, and um, here's Dr. Blackburn. Um, they, they put together this uh, geothermal uh, map of of the uh, of North America, and uh, 
big, the big piece of new work here was they corrected the bottom hole temperatures from you know some thousands of uh, wells. The geysers in California is really the main story for geothermal in this country. And going through it very quickly, uh, it started in uh, well, you know, they have they're California people, good promoters. It was originally called Gates of Hell, and then in the 1880s uh, they changed it to the geysers. And of course, they're not actually geysers; they're just hot springs. First well drilled in 1921 blew out. The second well, uh, they got it under it did blow out, but they got it under control. Uh, by 1923, they got down to uh, 97 meters and 153 degrees centigrade of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, steam, uh, steam water at four atmospheres. And it wasn't until the 30s that uh, they focused in, and this is uh, about, you know, it's about 10, 20 years behind the Italian uh, groups. But they got the uh, first geothermal power plant built, 35 kilowatts. And here's, here's where geothermal starts to interact with the oil and gas. By that time, oil was so cheap that it didn't make sense to drill wells for geothermal. So they, they, the contract was uh, terminated. And, and then 20 years, 25 years later, it picked up again. Purchase agreement. That means you've got somebody that's going to take your power for a number of years, and very often that's 20 or 30 years. Uh, I remember these stories about Unical. This is where I start remembering the, that there is there was something called the geysers uh, in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, just a curiosity. But Unical was the operator. 2005, Calpine became the operator. And I think Calpine's still headquartered in Houston. I know they had some problems with uh, wells along the Gulf Coast, uh, getting them down through pressure, but uh, they, you know, they obviously took over the, the geysers and are doing well out there. Uh, it's a big part of their business. In the, uh, they was overproduced as many fields are, but in the 90s, starting in the 2000s, they uh, developed this uh, uh, recharge system where they got the wastewater from the Clear Lake area and from Santa Rosa, and we're bringing in, well, now it's 9 million gallons a day from Clear Lake and, and uh, 11 million gallons a day from uh, Santa Rosa. So they've got their production back up. So they went from, you know, uh, the, this, this, pick, this, this, setting, this setting in the 30s to what's now a very modern uh, geothermal plant. And I have my comment up here. When, when we could travel, it would be a great HGS field trip. You can fly to Sacramento and take buses down. Okay, uh, in, in, for, my, for me, uh, in the mid-90s, I was working with uh, Merlin Verrett, and we're doing South Louisiana stuff. If there's any old people in the audience, you might remember Merlin. Department of Energy. University of Texas, you know, everybody in earth science so were participants in a huge multi-year study to try to test for geothermal uh, uh, geopressured reservoirs in the Gulf Coast. And it was uh, very involved. There's volumes written on this. Um, um, if you note, on more, many of my slides, I have the, uh, the links to, uh, to articles. Uh, but this one, you can just type in that material and you'll get, you know, five or six books. Uh, the, one of the ideas was to uh, uh, produce uh, abandoned oil wells for the geothermal fluids. And that, that really didn't work out because uh, the, the boreholes were not designed to carry the fluid volume required, which is anywhere from 20,000 to 50,000 barrels a day of brine at hopefully 300 Fahrenheit plus. And, and that's what it would take. But the, uh, the uh, Department of Energy did uh, actually drill uh, test wells in Brazoria County, and they put together a little uh, um, um, experimental geothermal power plant, which, which worked for about, they, they ran it for six or eight months. Now, uh, this is part of my personal story, uh, but it's also a very interesting part. This Tina uh, 
a resort area uh, just a little north northeast of Fairbanks, Alaska. This is a 2006 period. Uh, if you notice that APG map was, two, was 2004, there was a lot of buzz. This was an area where uh, power was costing uh, 30 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, they finally figured out they could do geothermal. Uh, actually, nobody wanted to do it. Finally, they got the, the carrier division of United Technologies to come in, and they basically reverse engineered some of their big commercial air conditioning units and came up with this these organic Rankin style uh, or organic Rankin um, uh, cycle uh, uh, power plants and only producing about uh, 200 kilowatts but they went from 30 cents to five cents and uh, other geothermal power in the area it can be used for greenhouses, and I think they heat the lodges with that as direct use. And when I say organic Rankin cycle, that means they use an organic chemical, and they're mostly the uh, hydrofluorocarbons, fluorolines, not the carbons anymore, but uh, fluorolefins um, that are used in air conditioning. This is quite a breakthrough because it now makes geothermal fluids in the uh, oh, two, you know, close to 200 degrees Fahrenheit range. Uh, very attractive. Now, uh, going along with this, there was a fair amount of activity in the mid-2000s, and uh, I don't know how many of you actually know that Texas, the General Land Office, had a water bottom lease sale, a state water bottom lease sale. There's the Houston Business article. Uh, they, they were figuring that there's uh, 2,000 megawatts of potential uh, Baker Hughes commented on it. They were doing international projects at the time. They had a division. Schlumberger has a division. Uh, there was even, here's 2007, they were talking about carbon trading and emissions. Warmat's a very interesting uh, company. It's an Israeli company. They've developed many geothermal uh, um, power plants throughout the world. And uh, so um, this uh, this, this was a big deal. There were, ORMAT took some leases. I think there were some other California and Nevada people took some leases, but I don't ever remember a well being drilled. My clients at the time, independent oil companies, they, they were aware of this as a curiosity, but weren't interested. And you have to remember at this time, um, fracking was starting to take off. Uh, <clears throat> This map is a late, later map from, again, the SMU Geothermal Lab. Uh, they've, they've continued progress on that. This is one of a series of maps that uh, break down heat and heat flow in the US at different, this is the surface, but they do it at different uh, depths of burial. So you can see, no, no surprise, the tectonically active west is uh, is of interest the uh, the uh, Cascade Volcanic Range, the Basin and Range, uh, the Rocky Mountain areas, the extension of the Basin and Range down through New Mexico, and and a little bit of Texas. Uh, the the hot spots up in the Arctic area are interesting, as is that one up there in South Dakota. And uh, this is uh, this this is the this will be future research. Uh, my particular areas of interest are only in the drillable current, you know, present day drillable conventional type reserves. And just to finish up uh, the topical news, uh, I don't know if you guys saw that, but uh, CGG did a big uh, 700,000 well, uh, I guess, major, you know, they didn't say it was, probably. Pro pro probably total. I got a, 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 a and, and of course, uh, bringing this up to today, I was very glad to see in the November bulletin that there are actually four, uh, three discussions on geothermal and one discussion on transitions. And uh, for, as, as oil and gas geologists, making the transition to geothermal it's pretty straightforward. Of the uh, of the uh, renewable energies, as it, again as a geologist, I prefer geothermal number one because it is true 
24-7 baseload power. Number two, it is earth science oriented, which as the industry changes from uh, hydrocarbon and chemical energy to geothermal energy, uh, that, that should provide opportunities for geologists. And then just to note that uh, the leading edge in December had a special issue on geothermal. Okay. My intro slide. Uh, we're going to discuss the plate tectonics of geothermal plays. And when you see a star here, little asterisks on these different type of plays, it indicates that it's proven a commercial play. In other words, people have made money making, uh, doing geothermal in that process. So we have what? One, two, three, four different types of plate tectonic systems. And I've regrouped some of these other things like uh, plate margin interplate on mantle plume to, to kind of into one of those four. So on plate margin, you have Iceland. Uh, that's Atlantic plate margin spreading center. Uh, interplate, you have Hawaii, which is within the Ocean, Pacific Oceanic Plate. Then you have Yellowstone within a North American continental plate. Uh, we'll see a couple of these as we go on. Uh, as far as onshore rift complex uh, plays that are active, we have the East African rift system. Uh, the nascent or evolving uh, onshore rift complex plays would be the Western USA Basin Range province in Nevada and California. Uh, we're actually, at this point in time, portion of California and and uh, Nevada are trying to rift away from the United States. It's in the nascent process right now. Uh, number three, you have plate margin uh, volcano plays. Most of those are on the Pacific Ring of Fire. You got in Western um, Pacific, uh, Indonesia, Japan, the Philippine Islands, and um, Bob will discuss even more than those three. In the Eastern Pacific, we have the Northwest, uh, Northwest, uh, uh, North, Northwestern USA Cascade Trend, which is California, Oregon, and Washington State and also Western Canada. And as you can see, there's no little red asterisk on that yet. Uh, there's ge geothermal potential there, it's very high, but it's not being addressed at this juncture. Uh, go down to number four, you got passive continental margin, high temperature, high pressure deltaic plays. And these are mainly onshore Cenozoic deltas. Uh, uh, the one that's pr proven uh, commercial is the Gulf, Gulf of Mexico Frio in a minor sense by the DOE and the Wilcox trend. Both of these should have very high potential. Uh, you go to other on onshore or Senegal deltas, you have onshore Nigeria, but Nigeria is so rich in oil and gas, it's so cheap there, uh, they really don't need to address uh, geothermal at this juncture. Now, conversely, when you go to Indonesia, it's a different story. They're running out of oil and gas, and now they've had to go to geothermal to keep the power on. Okay, Iceland's plate margin, mantle plume, and geothermal areas. Uh, can you see my mouse there moving around? I don't know if you can or not. If not, I'll use the pointer. There we go. Do you see my laser pointer there? Uh, Greenland at one point in time uh, was a separate, it, separ it was a, attached to North America and it became a separate continent during Laramide time. You had early Laramide uh, opening on the western part of the continent. And you had late Laramide opening on the eastern part of the continent. You can see this little uh, magenta circle here, that's Iceland. At one point in time, Iceland sat all the way against uh, uh, the Greenland continent. You can see how much uh, spreading you've had between uh, uh, Western Europe and Greenland uh, just, just since the beginning of Laramide time. On the right, you see the low temperature and high temperature geothermal fields. Almost all the energy in, in uh, Iceland comes from these geothermal fields. And here's what they look like. Uh, you got this uh, uh, power station here, Miss Jostler, I guess how they pronounce it. Uh, and you can kind of see the stacks up in here. You can kind of see where it is down to the right over here. It's in the hotter, hotter part of the system. Moving on. Uh, now we're going to move into the uh, Basin and Range province of the United States. Uh, and that's probably where a lot of the, a lot of the commercial heat, right, uh, geothermal in the United States is associated with uh, the Basin and Range province. Uh, over here to the left, you have the Clear Lake area, which is a different kind of province. Uh, it's associated with the uh, San Andreas Fault. But you have in, in this old the Basin Range province, you had a thermal dome that came up in Paleogene time. The remnants of that thermal dome, because it underwent collapse in the Sierra ne uh, Nevada Range over here, which would be a big rift shoulder, uh, massive fault, fault system you have here. And on, uh, that's on the west, southwest. And on the southeast, you got the, Wa the Wasatch Chain would be the southeastern counterpoint to that same uh, thermal collapse. There's a caldera, it's called the McDermott caldera, I believe. 
And the uh, Yellowstone uh, hotspot originated at this caldera. It moved relatively to the uh, northeast, right about where it is right now. Uh, and there was a, there's a big caldera now where that collapse system was. Most of the commercial geothermal fields sit down within this red, uh, red zone down here. But there's potential all up through here, down through here, and even down into New Mexico. Uh, when you look, you'll see that, uh, look at, you notice when this thing came up as a thermal dome, it was a high area. All the rivers were deflected around that high area. You'll notice you know, the, the uh, uh, Snake River up in here, the Sacramento, the San Joaquin down here, the Colorado River down through here, all got, and the Yellowstone River coming up this way, all got deflected off that huge uh, uh, rising landmass. We go to the right, what you see is uh, uh, things collapsing by dextral shear. Uh, that right, I guess right, uh, right lateral dextral shear, and here's your outbreak area of your Columbia River basalt group up in here. Uh, these things that look uh, kind of straight here, these are mafic dikes. The radial faults come off through here, so you get an idea of what this thing looks like. Uh, this yellow outline here is the same yellow outline you have over here. Moving on, uh, this is a field. In this position in Nevada here, it's called Desert Peak Geothermal Field. And this is a north-south geologic cross-section across that field. The position of the cross-section is AA prime. is represented by AA prime up here. And what do you really see here? Uh, you, most of your production comes from the uh, fractured basement down in here, although you get a little uh, support volume from this stuff up in here. Uh, it's almost all basement rock. Uh, and uh, uh, what you see here is this is the very shallow. This is what 1,200 meters or so, <laughs> uh, zero meters here, and about 1,250, 1,300 meters down through here. Uh, what you really have here is an accommodation zone between two uh, uh, hot spring mountains, rift, uh, 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 rift basin. As you go to the go to the north, it rifts down this way, down to the south. You go down here, it rifts down the other way. So you get this accommodation zone. Where this accommodation zone exists, you get a, a geothermal field. Now, if this were oil and gas, the same accommodation zone that, that's, that sits a, a, on the opposing rift walls, you would also have oil fields there. Many of the big fields and rift basins sit on these accommodation zone highs, and that's what this is. Now, this is this distribution of energy productive volcanic centers. You see most of them are along the Pacific Ring of Fire, a few of them on the Caribbean plate. Again, this is the uh, Pacific Ring of Fire down through here and all the way down into through here. Uh, you can kind of tell by the dots how much proven uh, resources and megawatts of energy they have. Uh, the red ones are very, very good. That's around Japan. And if you get a little bit lower, it gets down through here to New Zealand. Uh, they're actually producing even up from Kamchatka, Kamchatka uh, Peninsula. A lot of production from the island around the island of Java there in Indonesia. Uh, this uh, a bit, a kind of interesting slide here it came, comes off of USGS. AA prime here is AA prime here. Uh, what you have offshore is an oceanic spreading center here. And you kind of see it jogging along up in here. Now here's a continental margin up through here. And you develop a you know, outer, outer arc high in here, which is non-volcanic. And then you develop an, a volcanic arc. This volcanic arc, and it goes all the way up into almost to Alaska here. I guess it actually does go to Alaska. It's called the Cascade Range. Subduction, uh, this plate's going down. You get a magma chain to a conduit coming up, and you get volcanic eruptions. Uh, again, that this over here. This is, shows the volcanic threats. Very high are these uh, 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 maroon triangles. Ones that are high but not as high uh, will be the uh, orange triangles. And at very low and lowest gets down through here. Mount St. Helens is obviously very high. It blew up in the middle 1980s, and about a third of the mountain disappeared. This whole area down here is very interesting. Actually, this area is, although remote up in here, is, is very interesting also. You get an idea of the amount of eruptions, when we talk about the amount of eruptions and why you have these, these, uh, these uh, maroon triangles. So you can kind of see the Mount Rainier, Mount Rainier, Mount, Rainier, Mount St. Helens, and Mount Adams, which sits in this triangle down here, all very, very active. Very good geothermal uh, energy there. Now what we're going to look at here, here's Mount St. Helens here. Here's Mount Rainier. Again, here's Mount Adams. And there's a uh, magma chamber down through here. And there's a Spirit Lake baffle that sits above it. What's happened is 
uh, the magma, the magma is coming from this lower uh, magma chamber is coming up around. It won't go through the batholith. That's what I believe is the legacy niche. And since Miocene time has been coming up around that and giving you all these uh, volcanic events, Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier, even a little wet over here at Goat Rocks and Mount St. Adams. This is from a Nature Just Science article. Uh, now, here's the last one we were talking about. Uh, uh, before we were talking about uh, convergent margin volcanics. Now we're going into uh, passive margin areas. Your targeted sands are down in here where you get disconnected thick deltaic sands on deltaic growth faults. And here would be the uh, 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 a combination of the uh, Wilcox and the Free, I believe Free are here and Wilcox standing through here. And of course, this is uh, right now the main, uh, the main success there would be Pleasant Biofield in uh, Missouri County, Texas. So we'll go back to Bob here. I'll stop. Okay, world distribution of place examples. Okay, um, first off, I want to explain this uh, uh, McKelvey diagram because I put it in the abstract. Uh, you know, it's, it's the earth. You say, hey, how hard is it to get heat out of the earth? You go to keep drilling. Well, you know, economically, you don't want to just drill anywhere or drill forever. So we're up here at the top. And, uh, you know, it's the, it's the USGS. You have reserves, you have proven reserves, you have possible reserves, you have the resources. So everything is up here in resources and it's reserves, of course, once it's drilled, and that's the geothermal energy we've been talking about. And I'm calling everything basically above 10,000 feet is conventional. Uh, below 5,000 feet is deep conventional, but we're not going in talking about uh, engineered geo geothermal systems or uh, loop, loop systems. Uh, so we're looking for uh, high temperature, steam saturated rocks above 10,000 feet in natural fractures. Uh, in, in the Gulf, in, in, in the uh, tertiary uh, clastics, of course, we're looking at uh, uh, intergranular porosity, but in, in the hard rock areas of the West, uh, we're looking at fracture porosity. And depending on temperature and water saturation, it'll, the, the heat will come up as steam or it'll, come, or it'll be very hot water that'll flash the steam as the pressure is released, or it'll be this moderate temperature water, which is, let's say, uh, 175 Fahrenheit to 350 Fahrenheit. And then that's, that's for the binary power plants. And then hot, hot, well, warm water, you can use that for uh, direct use, but we're not really dealing with that today. Uh, here's, you know, here's the places in the world where we have current production and the amounts of production. So as Steve was saying, it's primarily, you know, the Pacific Ring of Fire on the uh, west coast of the Americas and the east coast of uh, Asia and in, into the uh, South Asia, uh, Southeast Asian islands. I, I've got, uh, let me see. So on this map, we have about 13,000 megawatts of power. And projections in the literature and research would indicate that we can easily quadruple this, and I, I suspect have 10 times more. Uh, New Zealand, in the North Island, in the Rift, New the New Zealanders went to uh, Italy in the 50s and learned geothermal from the Italians, and now they're produ producing over a thousand uh, thousand megawatts of power. Uh, as Steve said. Indonesia is really chasing this because th they need the hydrocarbons to be exported for their cash flow to the government. And so for domestic consumption, they've got to get into geothermal. They're, they've, they're in geothermal in a big way, producing uh, uh, 2,000 megawatts now and with a projected 20, 20, 27,000 megawatts of potential. And they there is... There are international geothermal conferences. They hosted one. They'll host one in 2021. Um, you can see 
the distribution of the hot spots along the the, uh, the the arc. Again, this is these are all areas where geologists and geology needs to be done. Philippines is a major producer, around 2,000 megawatts, but they're also ramping up to uh, uh, to 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 continue to go green and to uh, uh, improve their economy with energy, with power. Uh, China, very, very little. You can see they're, they're in the realm of still putting together, you know, the, uh, the, heat, the, the heat flow maps and such and trying to figure out where they can get some geothermal energy. But they're, they're a continental interior. They have a little bit of production here in southeast China. Um, who knows what will happen in the Himalayas, but uh, that's a developing story. Uh, Russia is interesting in that we certainly have quite a few oil companies operating in the Kamchatka, uh, Kamchatka Peninsula area. Uh, there's a number of volcanoes, and there's a tremendous resource potential there. And oddly enough, uh, the Russians were the first to come up with the binary plant idea. And I'll just I'll show some diagrams on that in a little bit. But basically, with a binary plant, uh, you're, you're, you you don't ex you just recycle your your hot fluid against a heat exchanger, and the heat exchanger evaporates that organic uh, um, liquid, which boils at a, at a low temperature, and, that, and that's the, uh, the, the uh, uh, vapor that drives the turbine. And now let's look at the economic value of projects. You can see basically geothermal is, almost isn't on the, on the chart. You know, it's just, a, it's just a line at the bottom, very minor. But there's a term, the, the, the potential for geothermal now that the world is worried about the sea based on a uh, uh, on an average uh, LNG fired power plant. This chart, this is a great quote uh, from this uh, uh, author it, for geothermal. It's an engineering problem that, when solved, solves energy. And uh, so here, we, here's the whole gamut of temperature ranges you're looking at for binary geothermal in the, in the uh, well, 175 to 200 range, all the way up as hot as you can go. You know, uh, equipment and metals have issues. Uh, in the lower temperatures, you can start using uh, direct heat, which is for institutions, for instance, the uh, Oregon Institute of Technology uses uh, um, geothermal uh, fluids for heating their buildings. A big portion of uh, downtown uh, Boise, Idaho does that, and other places throughout the world do that. One of the most interesting ones, if you start getting up into the 400 degree Fahrenheit plus temperature range, you can start using geothermal fluids for steam methane reforming, which is what they do in the refineries now. And that's a big deal for uh, the natural gas business because uh, they can turn their natural gas using green technology into a green fuel. Uh, the tip the, here's a quick uh, diagrams of the type of uh, power plants. This, the dry steam you take your your your, your your fluid comes out of the ground. It's as steam. You run it across the, the uh, turbine. You cool it. And you re-inject. As I say, they learned that at the geysers. For many years, they didn't re-inject, and they were running out of fluids, but they seem to have solved that. Uh, flash steam is where it comes up as a water, but with the pressure reduction, uh, but the steam flashes out. You can use the steam for the, directly for the turbine, and then you can take the water and use it for other things. And they actually have what's called the combined cycle, where they put another, they, they put another uh, heat exchanger across that and use the steam directly and the uh, organic chemical plant, which is when you're talking at some temperatures around 300 F, this is probably what you'll use. And uh, that's been a big breakthrough since the, uh, well, really since I guess the, the, uh, the 70s. 
uh, now the question is, what's a what's what what's a geothermal megawatt worth? And uh, basically, it's it's a whole different payment structure than oil and gas. You're you're looking at a a, a, a project that'll produce fairly consistently for 30 years. So you've got a you know your whole. I'm not going to go into this, but and such. But one of the things is your risk profile is different. So you may be able to uh, borrow money against your uh, power purchase agreement. You know, if you've got a utility that's going to, it's guarantees to buy your power for 30 years, well, you can borrow against that contract, and so your capital costs are different. And then you, the question comes: Well, if geothermal is so great, why hasn't been hasn't it been a bigger part of the renewable energy mix? And the answer to that is: Up until recently, the big utilities were not giving power purchase agreements for geothermal; they were giving them all to wind and solar, and uh, in part because uh, those projects are just straight up engineering, number one. Number two, for uh, you know, every megawatt of installed solar, you could probably have to put in uh, two or three megawatts of uh, gas, and those are very understandable and reliable businesses. But you know, it's, it, as, as people become more concerned about CO2 in the energy mix, they're less desirable. And that's where that, uh, that other diagram where I mentioned uh, hydrogen is going to be a big deal. Uh, you could store energy two ways, or there's many ways, but two of the ways is you can store it as, a, as electricity in batteries, or you can take the, uh, you, you can store it as hydrogen and in compressed or liquefied hydrogen and use that energy later. Okay. So I'm going to pass it back to Steve Getz. We're going overtime on this, but uh, I hope uh, everybody's staying with us. Let me see if I can get out.